Angelique Adams is the founder and CEO of Angelique Adams Media Solutions, which is a platform dedicated to helping diverse talent excel in their careers by delivering the best actionable advice from successful insiders. Uh, Angelique knows firsthand the challenges of being underrepresented at work, despite being laughed at by professors when she told them she wanted to pursue a PhD. Dr. Adams had a successful career in the metals and mining sector, most recently serving as chief innovation officer at a multi-billion dollar European steel maker, Aperum. Uh, following or after more than 20 years in corporate innovation, she discovered her true passion is developing people, not products. Following the successful publication of her first career guide, You're More Than a Diversity Hire, which several of you got autographed copies of last night, so I really hope that you read that book. It's incredible. Um, Women in STEM, she uh, launched Angelique Adams Media Solutions, which creates books, online courses, and coaching programs. She has a PhD from Penn State and an MBA from MIT. She lives uh, here in Knoxville, Tennessee with her husband and two children. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Angelique. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm very excited. You know, when Catherine invited me and she told me the theme, I was just really excited to, to share my own story. Um, and really for two reasons. I mean, first of all, I truly believe that we all have unique gifts um, that we can give to the world and make a contribution. And the second reason is because I have been struggling myself uh, even recently with really acknowledging what my gifts are and then figuring out what am I going to do about it? So I hope that uh, I'm going to I'm going to share my my journey with you and I hope that you get some ideas about how to recognize your own uh, your own superpowers. But most importantly, I hope that you will accept my call to action to use your superpowers in whatever way speaks to you. So I really didn't start to feel like I had some kind of unique gift until fairly recently and about five years ago. Um, I got a little thank you note in my mailbox just just here at home and um, I kept it because it was uh, it was important to me. But a neighbor uh, gave me this thank you note and she said, thank you so much for being so kind to my mother yesterday. And I paused and I was reflecting, OK, I know who this woman is. I met her yesterday at a family bar at a community barbecue. And I remember um, chatting, there was a group of women and we were just chatting about early childhood education. We all had kids of various ages and we were chatting about you know, the importance of allowing kids to make mistakes and the importance of summer reading and, and various things like that. And I remember this, wo this woman and her mother was actually a retired school teacher. So I was asking her, you know, what do you think? How have things changed? I was really trying to pick her brain. And so I thought, OK, I don't recall doing anything especially kind in that conversation, but OK. So I, I, I kept reading the note and she said, you know, my mom has Alzheimer's and she often just sits there by herself and people ignore her because she's not uh, usually very interactive. So thank you for engaging her in this lively conversation and making her feel like she was valued. And I thought, OK, again, I didn't think I did anything special. I was like, she's an expert in a field that I was interested in. So I was asking a lot of questions. But for this woman and and her mother, it was significant. It really had touched them. And I thought, wow, that's really special that I can just be myself and do something that I really thought was um, just a normal thing to do. Uh, but for them, it was it was really a special gift that had touched them. And I think that that is maybe something we can think about um, ourselves, that sometimes our superpower is just, some, is just us just being ourselves. And we have to pay attention to um, the world around us to really see you know, how we might be impacting people. So, you know, I kept going, you know, moving on, life moves on. And I started to realize that maybe this 
skill set that I have where I really like to listen to people attentively and engage with them and maybe on purpose or without them know without uh, without me knowing uh, uplifting them in some way was something that I was doing on a broader scale. And I got a really good indication of this about two and a half years ago, actually at work. I was in Brazil with one of my teams and um, I was based in Europe at the time. So I was only going to Brazil, you know, about every six months. And so when something like that happens, you can imagine it's back to back to back meetings all day long um, because they're trying to sort of get you up to date on everything, pick your brain for everything because they don't get to see you face to face that often. So I was in Brazil and I was actually on one of the coveted breaks in between all of these meetings. And I was sitting there having a cup of coffee and my manager, um, he came in and said, Angelique, I really want you to meet this young intern. He is working on a special project and he'd like to share it with you. And I thought, um, OK, I was really hoping I could have my break, but OK, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to this this intern's project. So I pulled up a chair and I had. Uh, had him, his name was Enrique, I had him sit next to me. He showed me his software program and um, I asked him several questions and I congratulated him on the work he had done and told him how impressed I was with how much of an improvement it was over what we had before. And then my director, you know, escorted him back out. They had a side conversation in Portuguese that none of which I caught. And my manager came back in and he was laughing. And I was like, you know, what's so funny? And he said, oh, Enrique was so nervous. He didn't sleep at all last night. He was so nervous to talk to you. And, and I was angry. I said, why did you do that? I mean, I only come here every six months. I do not want my team to be afraid of me. And, you know, this presentation that he just gave me was not on the list of priorities. You know, why in the world would you do that? And he said, um, Angelique, we did that on purpose. And I was like, why? He said, we knew that he was going to be safe with you. We knew that you were going to listen to him attentively. You were going to ask him some questions and he was going to leave that interaction with you, even though it was only four minutes feeling better about himself and more motivated about his work than when he walked in. And I was like, okay, if you say so, I <laughs> sounds kind of fishy to me, <laughs> but I trust you. So, okay. And, you know, we finished the rest of the day with the meetings and, uh, and that was it. But when I went back to my hotel room and I had a chance to relax, I realized that something really important had happened. You know, I had been struggling with my own leadership style and figuring out, OK, how can I be myself? How how can I lead this big team of people and get results and still be myself, which myself is is what I just did. Um, and I was realizing that I had done it. I had achieved that goal. And not only was I, you know, having this impact on people, but my team wanted more of it. They wanted to expose others to my leadership style, which is about listening attentively to people and uplifting them by, you know, helping them identify their important contributions. So I was feeling really, really good about that. And then when I went back, I started to pay attention and I realized that that this was happening much more broadly, that many of my uh, staff were trying to spend more time with me, wanting to get my advice, wanting me to hear what they're working on in the hopes, you know, that I would listen attentively and help identify the contributions that they made so that they would get this positive feedback about their work. And even beyond my own organization, human resources was noticing that and they were asking me to mentor more people. They were asking me to sponsor projects with younger top talent so they could get exposed to my um, my leadership style and you know, get some of this sort of positive reinforcement 
that I um, was just naturally wanting to share with with the people that um, that I worked with. And so all of those things were, were, were going really well. They asked me to make some videos. And so I made some videos about my leadership style, which I was actually teaching people some of the techniques that I used to, to actually do this. And they were translating them into multiple languages and sending them all, all over the company. Um, so I was really feeling like, finally, I have kind of figured out what at least one of my or two of my um, important uh, skills are and that they're having a positive contribution. And at the same time, I was actually starting a side project and I was using the same skill set of listening to people um, and trying to identify their significant contributions. And, um, and I put that in a book. I just wrote it down. <laughs> what they told me, I wrote it down and put it in, in my book. And I was getting positive feedback about that also. And so I was really feeling, you know, over, over a couple of years, feeling like this, you know, this is really it. I've, you know, I finally hit my stride. I finally found my comfort zone um, with this particular leadership style. And one thing I have to point out is, you know, at least in, in my industry, and, and this may be true for many of you, there's certainly this, um, this idea that, okay, yeah, she can be nice and she can be, you know, positive, but can she get results? So let's just, just dispel that myth also. Um, at the same time, you know, I was building relationships with my team and getting, you know, all this positive reinforcement and building them up, up uplifting them. I was getting excellent results. So I would brought in the biggest client in, uh, in the company. I mean, you know, top 10 billionaire type of, uh, type of client. And we had also grown the value of the, the portfolio of innovation products um, that I was responsible for by tens of millions of dollars. So, so there really wasn't this question, at least in my mind, <laughs> there wasn't this question that I could, you know, have this leadership style, use my special gifts and still get results, even though it was very much not the norm. Um, the the company that I was working at at the time and and had you know the, the companies I've worked at in the past really focused more on um, you know let's just make sure people do their job we're, we're not real big on patting people on the back and and doing you know out of boys and out of gals we're we're um, focused more on um, results and we would rather highlight when people do things wrong than than focus on on the positives so but all signs were, were indicating that my way was working and, and I was feeling good about finally having sort of found my stride, um, except for the top leadership in the company. For whatever reason, they didn't like the, the way I was doing things and, and told me so. They said, you know, Angelique, we uh, we we like the results that you're delivering, but really we don't believe in <laughs> sort of positive reinforcement. We believe that that will ultimately lead to uh, workers being complacent, um, and we like to make we like to really focus on where they need to improve, because we believe that maintaining this kind of tension of always always feeling like, you know, you have to keep striving for more and more. We feel like that's really the way um, that the culture in this particular organization, and that's really the way that we um, prefer um, our leaders to, to behave. They said, but, you know, we really like your results. So we're willing to mentor you, um, basically to teach you how to stop uplifting people. So, so I said, okay, I mean, I needed to basically make a decision. I mean, I, I had, I had a, a couple of choices to make. I mean, I could keep doing the way things I was do the way I was doing things and, and probably, you know, ultimately uh, butt heads with, with my organization. I could stop what I was doing um, and, you know, try to learn how to fit more in, in the culture uh, for the company that I was in or, or maybe, you know, a, a third option. Um, and so I really struggled with that for many months, actually, because I just didn't know what to do. 
And I felt like on the one hand, I had a job I really liked, um, working with people that I really liked on projects I really liked. On the other hand, I was feeling like they were, they really were asking me to, to change myself in a way that I wasn't sure I could do. I mean, on the one hand, you know, it's really about feedback. And so it's, there's, you know, you can just stop, <laughs> you know, stop giving uh, positive feedback, but it, it was such a part of me. It was something that deep down I felt like was who I am and a, a way of being that was so important to me that I really struggled with what, you know, was I willing to, to let that go in order to, um, in order to really fit in with, with where I was. And so many months of struggling with that. And ultimately I decided um, to, to leave. I decided that focusing on really using my superpower to uplift people and um, make what I thought uh, a leadership style that I thought was really useful and people was really resonating with people was more important. So I really leaned in on, leaned in on that um, and decided to use my book that was you know, doing reasonably well and then to use that as a, as a springboard for what I do now, which is uh, really the, the skills of listening and, and um, finding contributions for, for people and helping them to see what's inside of them and, and how um, those can, uh, can be used uh, in their own career development is the cornerstone for, for really what I do now. Um, I focus on people who are underrepresented at work because I feel like um, they have the least amount of positive feedback and reinforcement and coaching and mentoring and all of those things. And the data supports that. Of course, that's also my own personal experience um, has been that uh, I've struggled uh, in my own career. And so I'm focusing on, on that group of people and really have decided to take my superpower to try to address you know, this much broader issue that I feel very passionate about. So I don't know how it's gonna go. I'm <laughs> literally, you know, I'm eight weeks in so, uh, to doing this full time. So I'm, I'm using Catherine as a role model um, uh, to see how to actually sort of grow your own uh, business and turn your passion project into, into, something, uh, into something big. So um, it's yet to be seen as whether or not this is gonna be uh, the right thing for me or not. Um, but I felt like that was the way to really use my superpower. And once I started to see how big of an impact it could have, I really couldn't stop doing it. And so that was the decision you know, that I made. And so now we have to, we're bringing things to you all. So um, the question, you know, as we go through the workshop and we, we discover what, what our superpowers are, the real question is, how are you going to use them? So whether or not you make this huge leap like I did and uh, do something that may or may not turn out to have been crazy <laughs> and use your superpower in a full-time capacity to try to do something big for a, a, um, a, a subject that you feel passionately about, whether you do that or whether you help your neighbor who is in a world that no longer values their contributions, those two extremes and everything in between is, is how we make the world a better place. And that is what superheroes do. So I hope that you will, you will use your, super, your superpowers. Thank you. Catherine? Thank you so much, Angelique. That was such a wonderful story. 
Um, thank you for the shout out. <laughs> um, and, and real life, just to let everybody know, all of a sudden our people decided to start cutting grass right now outside my window. So sorry, everybody, if you start hearing a lawnmower going by. Me. <laughs> but hey, it's real life. What can you do? Um, so thank you so much, Angelique. And um, thank you so much for for your openness and your honesty about, I think there's a lot of things that a lot of us can relate to, especially the the conversation around corporate, not necessarily agreeing with your leadership style. Um, I personally can, can also relate to that. Um, I think a lot of us can. So uh, as everybody starts thinking about uh, Angelique's story, we'll, we'll ask her a few questions. So, the first question is, um, listening attentively and providing uplifting and positive feedback is time intensive and requires uh, emotional intelligence and empathy. How did you maintain this with increasing leadership responsibilities and team size? Good question. Um, so I think that I built the skill at a very small team size. Um, and so it just naturally kind of scaled as the team size scale, to be perfectly honest. And I, I remember, the, I think, a time when it was extremely taxing. And it was uh, several years ago. I was um, I was leading a team of I was actually graduate students. We 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 had like 25 graduate students. We were sponsoring their work, and so once a year I would go to this college up in Quebec, and all of these students would want to give me presentations. And I remember sitting in there, and the first one that came in was wearing a suit, and I thought, oh, this is like really a big deal for them. I've got to listen <laughs> to every single one of these and ask them at last ask at least one of them a question so that they feel like you know it it was a huge deal for them and so that one instance where it was like eight hours and by the end i even told my team i said my brain was leaking out of my ear but what i what i learned by the kind of the end of that was that all i really needed to do was jot down a question kind of early on and then i could sort of know that i had that in my back pocket so even if my attention span you know uh wanes but if i at least just had one question early on i could i could ask that question and and i will tell you that you know as i was leaving this this previous role that always asking a question was something that they noticed and they told me they were like you always listen to us you always asked a question no matter what and that made us feel so valued um and so i think that that's kind of like the hack is really just to early on when you're when you're fresher and you have the attention span just dot, jot down a question and then you can always you know ask at least one one thing to let somebody know that okay you were paying attention that is enough because it's done so infrequently. Like you don't necessarily have to listen to the whole 30 minute thing or hour long thing and be deep into it. People are so like bereft of feedback that you just have to ask like one question early on. And that's enough, I think, to to send the signal to people that you are engaged and you are, um, uh, you know, care about them. Yeah, I, I love that because it uh, absolutely you you see a lot of leaders that will start to just completely disengage altogether. And you're like, why? Why am I even talking to this person? Are they even listening to me? Do they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and at least to show like, no, I care. Um, but I'm also trying to like reserve my own mental capacity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think the other thing, just as you as you mentioned, it made me think of something. The other thing that I did with my own team is I taught them how to talk to me. I taught them how to have their bottom line up front. I mean, which is a good communication skill to have anyway. But part of what I did in terms of uplifting them, in terms of upskilling them, was teaching them how to talk to leaders. And so not only did it give them a really important skill because 
man, leaders hate talking to scientists. <laughs> they get deep into that technical stuff super fast. And, you know, they're just like, oh, my gosh. So I taught them how to talk to leaders, um, which helped them with other leaders. But it also helped me because then I knew, OK, they're going to tell me immediately what the big deal is. And then I can ask, you know, ask questions about that. So there was a kind of a side thing there, too. I absolutely that is one of my favorite things to to do is like front load. Yes. Uh, the th yeah. Tell me what you need right away. And then, you know, sprinkle in the details in the back. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, OK, we have a few other questions. So um, given that level of attention and time to develop others um, can leave you spent, how do you refuel? Uh, good question. Um, well, one thing is that I actually I actually like doing it. So so I am energized by like when I see the spark in people, they're like, oh, like I didn't know, like, oh, I never thought that that was a good thing or oh, I never thought that that was like an important skill that I had. So seeing people get that spark when I, you know, help them uncover, you know, a, a contribution is is energizing to me. So that's one thing. Um, I'm a meditator, though, I mean, which I think is what you're really asking what my self care kind of <laughs> situation is like. I'm a meditator. Um, and I also am just sort of like a, a, a zone outer, I mean, listen to audiobooks or whatever. But I, um, I remember a, some sort of internet guru was saying, you know, people are always, always complaining about like kids on their devices and other people doing things. And he said, do not judge other people's escapism because escapism is needed. All humans need it. And whether you use a book or you, you know, Netflix or you, um, I met, um, a woman who plays uh, Second Life on on uh, <laughs> you know that that was her escapism. So um, so I am all all on board with that. And in my case, I like audiobooks. And I also um, you know if I see something good on Netflix, I have no problem spending you know half a day on Saturday <laughs> watching whatever I need to watch. So I I am aware of my of my energy levels. But I think th the most systematic thing is, is the meditation. Yep, I agree. I do. I think meditation takes on so many different forms too, um, which is one thing I love about it is that I think growing up, there was always this one view of what meditation was, which, you know, sitting um, on the floor, you know, repeating yep. something over and over to yourself. But um, really, meditation can look like so many different things. I, I'm a big doodler. So I, if I can oh, like okay. sit down yeah. and draw or, uh, or I drink a lot of tea. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. These are amazing questions, everybody. So let's see here. We have, um, how do you balance giving others what they need from you while maintaining your own authenticity? Um, good question. So, you know, one of the things that I do or have done is get really clear about my own boundaries um and th 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 that comes in a couple of different forms so one is time so you know i i make sure that i understand you know how much time i'm giving to people and how do i feel like managing my energy levels but then the other thing is like there's just some behaviors that i don't like okay <laughs> that people do and i'll give you the, my best one is complaining so you're always going to work with some people who complain and that just gets under my skin so much i mean i don't even let my children complain let alone like grown people in the workplace and so one of the things i do you know for example where I may be interacting with people that complain a lot is that I, I try to one kind of prepare myself in advance and two um, to kind of just manage, OK, this person's going to start irritating me very early on in this conversation. So what can I do to prepare for that? Um, and then also just communicate, you know, what what my expectations are. So you know, I think that tends to get easier the higher level up in an organization you get. And so, you know, frankly, I think I was my most recent job, I was to a point where I could pretty much say or do whatever I wanted and people would adjust to me. But prior to that, um, when I was really sort of in middle management and I'm trying to both grow, you know, my own staff and uplift people while I'm still, you know, having to deal with upper level management that 
and trying to grow myself, I mean, it, it can be it can be quite taxing. I will say that in retrospect, I think I bended myself too much. I was too concerned about what other people would say. I was too concerned about people not liking me. And it wasn't until prob, you know, later in my middle management years that I realized, no, it was actually okay to set these boundaries. In fact, people respected me when I, when I set my boundaries and I didn't need to focus on being uh, like so much sort of earlier on um, in my career. That's always a really difficult thing to learn in your career is that yes. you don't have to be liked. And that's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Which is funny because, you know, I don't like a lot of the people that I work with but so, or didn't. So it's like, why am I worried about whether or not these people like me? But it's just one of those things that you just have to get through. <laughs> right. right. And, there, and it's different between being respected and being liked. And, yep. and I feel like a lot of times we, we feel like those are the same thing. And it takes a while to understand that there's a delineation between likability yep. and respectability. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's see here. We have, um, do you feel that someone who identifies as an empath is better prepared for um, your type of leadership style? Hmm, that's a good question. I, you know, maybe, so I'm not, a, I'm not fully clear on the definition of an empath, but I will say that, you know, I think that if you are sort of comfortable with trying to understand where people are coming from and kind of finding their, you know, their both positive and maybe where they're struggling, but kind of finding in tune with how people are feeling um, and what they're struggling with. And then that, you know, that is sort of what I, what I pressed on in my, in my leadership style. And there are some people who are just like completely like don't see anything. Um, I think one of the challenges with, with that um, and something that, that I, you know, have, actually the same mentor who wanted to mentor me out of being positive he, he did have some good <laughs> good 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 feedback with me which was to not take it on so one of the struggles i had is you know when people were really one issue that i had in that organization was people were really really um fearful because of previous leadership and so they would sort of project all their fears and anxieties in these meetings and i was starting to take some of that on like i was leaving the day feeling anxiety and he was like you, you cannot take that on like you have to be able to let you know don't let anybody else's negative emotions you know stick to you at all and that can be also be hard though when you're really in tune with people's emotions so that is something that what i found and, and it was good advice he's like you don't have to be negative just because they're negative like you can still be positive even as they're telling you like their struggles, you can still smile, you can still be up, you can still feel the way that you want to feel. And that was an important lesson for me to learn. I I had a similar lesson when I worked um, at Geico, where you, we would constantly be talking to people who were having a horrible day because they had to call their insurance company, right? Um, oh, yeah. and, and it's like, talk about some of the, the most cruel people you will ever talk to or the people that are fed up with their insurance company. And I, I totally mm. get it. I connected with that full 100%. But one of the best things that my trainer ever taught me was that people, either you're going to come down to their level or people are going to come up to your level of, of energy. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're positive and you're trying to be helpful and you're trying to be engaging or you're listening to them, they will start coming up to your level um, as long as you maintain that. But it's very mm -hmm. easy for us to come down to their level and to be just as crabby as they are. Um, yeah. Nobody's happy. Right. Um, and so it's, it reminds me of the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll do, we'll do one more question. Um, and then if there's any questions, Angelique, afterwards that you'd like to answer in the chat, please feel free okay. to do so. Sure. Um, one person did ask about if your book is available on audiobook or ebook. So if you want to share links to how do people um, can sure. get your book, um, we can do that in the chat. So last question is, um, Changing the corporate paradigm externally is hard. Um, and this is from Meg Nocero. So she left the federal government because the leaders were toxic like yours. How do you become a voice that will affect change externally? Yeah, I mean, uh, so it's actually interesting because when I left the, the top leadership 
were devastated. They were like, like, we can't believe you're leaving. We want you to stay. What do we need to do? And I'm thinking to myself, you do realize that you told me you didn't like the way I did things. <laughs> Have you changed your mind? And they're like, no. Um, I, so my personal focus is actually on the people who are trying to excel in their careers. Cause I actually think external change agents, um, are not as effective as internal. So, you know, in my case, so I'm sure I could have stayed longer and gotten the whole sort of positive feedback and reinforcement thing to happen because in fact, HR was on my side and, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of people on my side, but I sort of felt like I don't really want to. Um, and I had even, I had made other changes internally um, that I thought were important, like accepting um, alternative career progression, making sure that women in particular who uh, who were identified as high potential but didn't want to move around because they had just had a baby, that they stayed on the high potential list because, you know, they don't... <laughs> <laughs> for a couple of years um, because, you know, their capacity doesn't change even if that given year, you know, maybe they didn't want to, they didn't want to move. So I think that there's a lot that can be done internally as change agents. And so my focus now is building the leadership capacity of people, um, diverse people, so that they can make those changes internally. Um, I Yeah. And I think external, I think external change agents there's certainly some that can be done, but I think the people that you're trying to change have to be open and willing. And so one of the things that I've been really proud about, you know, with my first book is how many men have read it, you know, not without me asking, you know, not at, not me asking, but just have read it and said, oh, I really learned a lot. I'm going to do something differently. So when people are open, um, then I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for changing externally. And I have one book in my pipeline um, that is called Leading Diverse Talent that I'm working on because people have asked me, OK, what can we be doing? We have this diversity and inclusion initiative. It's this big systemic program and it feels like it's going to take a long time and we're a little overwhelmed. Is there something we could be doing like short term actionable because I focus on actionable advice? Is there short term actionable things we could be doing to help us gain some traction? So because people are open and asking and willing to be coached, then that's where I see the entry point for someone like me as an external now, as an external change agent um, to have an impact. But really, most of my focus is on, OK, I need to build the leaders inside organizations because they're going to be the ones that are going to make the change. Yeah, and I think you're right. You can you can have an influence, but a, uh, a lot of times the unfortunate thing is that the change has to come from the inside out. Yeah. For both ourselves as individuals, but also for for organizations and, and communities. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Angelique, for for sharing your story and your insights and your you know uh, un un um, what what's the word I'm looking for? It's like unending wisdom. I think is the best word to use. Thank you so much. Um,